Okay, so welcome back everyone, hope you had a nice lunch. Um, first, uh, before we start again, I want to emphasize again, please do not bring any drinks or food into the room. Uh, we got a remark last year, so please let's avoid it this year. All right, so for the first talk of uh, the afternoon, I want to give the word to uh, Jake Valletta, who's going to talk about uh, Cobra Droid. So please give him a round of applause. All right, does everybody hear me okay? It should be good. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, the title of the talk is Cobra Droid, Hooking Android Applications. Uh, my name is Jake Valletta. Um, it's, we're going to talk a little bit about a tool I've been working on for about eight to 10 months so far. It's a tool to help people do uh, it's a dynamic analysis platform. So I apologize in advance, it's kind of dark up here, so some of the screenshots might be a little hard to see, it's much later on the screen down here. Um, so just a little bit about myself, I'm consultant at Mandy, back in the US. I've been there for about two and a half years. While I've been there, I've been able to do quite a, quite a few things, from forensics to pen testing to application security. Um, but I really enjoy doing mobile security, so um, that's kind of why I led down this road. When I have some free time, I like to talk on my blog and my website, um, blog.thecobraden.com and uh, www.thecobraden.com. And I put my Twitter handle on there too, but I'm not good at tweeting or anything, so not much going on there. So this is a little agenda for the talk. I'm going to start out uh, do a little background overview of the project. Uh, from there, we'll kind of talk about some of the features of the project, so some of the things that make Cobra really cool. Uh, and then it should take about 15 to 20 minutes for a nice demo of the tool. And then we'll kind of close out with some future plans and sort of a question and answer time period. So, for the background and overview, um, the tool that I created was meant for people who want to look and analyze an application. So there's there's quite a few people who want to do this, right? There's there's companies who are you know paying to have their applications reviewed. There are people who are doing you know malware analysis for a company or even in their own time. And there are also people who are just generally curious about Android applications. So you know, download an application <laughs> and it says Angry Birds wants to use the camera. So to be, why, why is that happening? Um, so when we do an application review or look at mobile malware, there's primarily two different phases, right? We have the static analysis phase where you know, we, we look at the code just sitting on our desktop. 
Um, and, and for that, we have a lot of tools, right? We have plenty of tools to take applications apart, reassemble them, make modifications, whatever we want. Um, tons, tons of disassemblers, and, and that's good. But on the other hand, when we look at dynamic analysis, uh, we don't really have as much tools to work with. Um, there are services. basically four uh, additional packages besides just the default Android ones. And you can just unzip the archive there and then launch the um, Android device editor. Um, and that's the picture on the left. Um, if you've ever created an Android virtual device, you basically give it a name, you give it a device, uh, some other parameters. And the one that you're interested in here is the, the target. So the target is usually, it's gonna say like ice cream sandwich, honeycomb, gingerbread, uh, in this case, there'll be a, if you copy it correctly, you'll see one for Cobra Droid 1.0. Um, so you can select that target, push OK, and then you can boot the emulator just like you're booting any other emulator. And but you'll be using uh, the Cobra Droid ones. So with that, now let's pretend we started it up and we'll talk about some of the features. Um, so I'm going to talk about it from kind of the kernel level down or upward. So we'll start with the kernel, we'll talk about some user space things, then we'll talk about the uh, the Dalvik VM that I've been working with, and then on top of that, just some Android applications. So when you ask the question, what is Cobra Droid? It was basically just a modified build of Android targeting the emulator. So the emulator for Android is much more powerful than, say, the iOS or the BlackBerry simulator, uh, because those simulators, uh, they don't run ARM code, they run x86, which means that you have to actually compile the application for the simulator. And when we're doing our test, we usually don't have that. We don't have the source code in the, the way they're compiling it. So uh, it's, it's very easy for us to take an application off a device and, or just from a client or from anywhere and install it on the emulator and, and just go. Cobradroid specifically is using uh, Android 2.3, which at this point is slightly dated. It's uh, the gingerbread one, which is the version before uh, Honeycomb. Um, but one of the time when I started, you know, ice cream sandwich was still just coming out, it was very fresh, so a majority of the market was still using gingerbread. Um, part of my future plans I'll talk about later is moving towards um, ice cream sandwich or jelly bean or Kit Kat, whatever you want to call it now. Um, so, starting at the very bottom, um, if anyone's ever played with the emulator in any sort of technical depth, you'll notice that the kernel is very old. Um, the code name for the kernel is the Goldfish kernel. And it sits on the Linux kernel version 2.6.29. And according to kernel.org, that was published in 2008. And that ships with the Android 1.5 devices donut, which, I mean, I never even know what donut phone I've played before my time. So it's really old. Um, so I wanted to kind of make that a little bit newer. So a couple reasons why I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to, first I wanted to kind of play with the kernel and see how it all works and kind of port my own. But there were some features that weren't in the 2.6.29 kernel, uh, specifically the Xtable extension that I wanted for net filters. So I wanted that to be in there. And I didn't want to get too far ahead. So uh, according to the Android website, uh, Android 3.0, which is um, Honeycomb, ships with this kernel region. So I figured that's kind of a good place to stop and still have the functionality that I wanted. 
In addition, there were some, some tweaks to the, the configuration files, such as enabling um, multiple kernel modules and a couple other net filter things to allow a lot of network manipulation, which uh, will took away from the end of the things later. So. so on top of that, it's sitting in the user space. If anyone's ever connected to your emulator or even your phone, which is running Android 2.3, you'll notice that the, the shell is it's pretty bad. Um, it's not a bad shell. It's a very restricted subset of like, the K shell, um, but it's it doesn't have any of the other features we want as a tester. It's fine if you're just going to look at an application, you know, put an application on the phone, like do a PS command or whatever, and see what's running. But it doesn't have any of really the, the shell features that we want. You know, we want coloring, we want pipes, we want completion, we want history. Um, and there's none of that on there. There's also no editors built in. So if you want to edit a file, you usually have to pull the file off, push the file back on. Uh, it would be nice to, to say like VI or Emacs and just have things work. So what I wanted to do um, is, is just port BusyBox, which is an embedded systems version of your standard Linux tools, and bash to Android. And that's actually very easy. It's already done. Uh, SciGemod already has that on their GitHub repositories. So I just cloned that and I created and built it in. Um, but, I mean, this isn't really anything groundbreaking here, but what it does is it makes the shell experience much more enjoyable. I mean, you can see it's just an LS command. The coloring, you have you know, much more commands that aren't typically there, which will definitely help when we try to do our assessment when we have uh, control we really want. Um, so for anyone also doing memory, for instance, which is becoming a much uh, more important thing in the scheme of things, uh, Lime, for instance, uh,
So that, that was pretty cool. And then for the build properties, um, so these are like your manufacturer, your model, any sort of other read-only parameters are stored in a read-only file on the system partition called uh, Etsy build.prop. And you, you can only edit this file at boot. So when the system boots, it'll read this file into um, the build library and everything and go as build. And then it'll populate some static values that contain the values of your phone. So whenever an application wants to model, it queries the build.model variable. And it can use that to get the values it needs. So we can do a little trickery. We can, uh, we can remove that library initialization from the Zygote, which means that this class isn't going to be initialized until the application itself starts. And that means at that time, we can actually hook the system properties class to actually return any arbitrary value there. So instead, when the, this file will technically be read when each application is started, which is cool. So now we can point that to a custom file and do the same thing. So on this screen, uh, in terms of screenshots, on, on the left, you'll see there is uh, the device ID. So this is all the radio parameters that I've exposed that you can change. So you can see that there's just some default values there. You can go ahead and change those to whatever you like and uh, update. In the middle um, is what I'm calling the property layer, which basically will parse out your build up prop file and let you edit that however you like. And it'll store it in a, a separate version, so you can always revert back. You can, uh, the next revision of Coder to be able to import this um, and be able to just take a, a property file off anywhere in the phone and import that and make it look pretty much like that phone. Uh, so on the right, I'm just changing the model, um, which is usually like a Razor or whatever, or just to iPhone 5. And it's not practical or anything, but it just shows that you can do something like that should you want to. Okay, um, so another thing from more of a network side is, you know, when we're doing these assessments, there's a variety of different SSL traffic going on between an application and a remote service. We could have an application that's not using any SSL, which in our case is really easy. We can throw a proxy between it, we can see all the traffic um, we want to. Um, and then there's applications that are doing SSL and probably not using it. And the fact that they're not checking the host name or perhaps they're explicitly trusting all certificates. And in that case, we can again put the proxy between it. And then there's this, this sort of new wave of doing things that's going on called certificate pinning. Uh, in which the application is actually including a specific certificate with the application. Uh, and that means when it goes to validate the CA and validate the SSL connection, it'll say, you know, is this certificate actually the one that I'm supposed to be trusting? And if we put our proxy in between there, it's going to say, well, no, it's not. And it's not going to work. And things might just silently break. It might give you an error. It's kind of depending on how the app's programmed. Um, and there are ways to get around this. Again, we can take our application, we can open it up and take a look at the cert and then replace it, generate our own cert, import the verb cert. Um, we can do that, but then we have to change it for every version of the application we have. We have to set up all these cert tools to make everything work right. It's, it's still a pain to do. Um, so I thought it would be a little easier to instead rewrite some of the SSL libraries. So by changing the constructors and some of the getter and setter values of the SSL libraries, we're able to have an application think it's doing things correctly. So it's it's calling the set hosting verifier function, um, well, method rather. And it's calling that method and it's setting up a, a very secure hosting verifier. But in reality, what it's actually doing is nothing. I mean, it's a void method, it's not returning anything. So in that setter, I just return it and it thinks, okay, now it's secure. Uh, and in the constructor, when you initialize these SSL contexts, it will pretty much just set it to the most insecure way possible. So the application really has no idea what is happening. It's just saying, oh, here's my SSL, here's my hosting verifier, I'm good to go. Uh, but in reality, it's, it's pretty much clear at that point. So that way, when we throw a proxy between this, we will not get any SSL of errors. And there's a couple of niche situations where, let's say, the, you know, they're using their own version of SSL, not included with the standard APK, uh, sorry, the standard libraries, or maybe they're, you know, they're extending these libraries, uh, then we're going to have an issue. So this works for all SSL libraries on 2.3. Um, on Ice Sandwich, they included a couple new ones to help with certificate pending in the browsers. And uh, that's not in 2.3, so that's not implemented yet. But for future plans, that'll be, that'll be part of it. Um, so I, I mentioned really early that, um, and even with SSL um, bypass, is that proxy traffic is pretty important. We really want to see what's going on. And because of those net filter rules that I enabled in the kernel, we're able to do a lot of really cool stuff with the traffic. Um, so one of the things that I found pretty tedious was uh, usually I, had, I guess I had a proxy going between myself and the server, 
Um, and I, I might also have Wireshark running on my host system and it's kind of capturing that capacity just so I have these, these captures for later. Um, but I'm getting a lot of noise when I'm doing that. I'm getting the, the, like, traffic from my host, I'm getting traffic from my application, and I'm getting traffic from any other application on the device. So I thought it would be really nice to say, I, I want to see traffic just from application X or application X to Y. And that way we can kind of isolate all this noise off and just kind of see what we actually care about. So um, we're able to do that, and we're able to take the file off the phone just by doing a, you know, maybe ADD pull, and open that up in Wireshark afterwards. So just to kind of demonstrate that here, um, on the left, we have the, the, the interface that we can use, where it's basically just a list of all our installed applications by package name. You can go ahead and select a couple. I just have a browser or a calendar selected there. And then on the right top, you can see that I'm just Googling Cobra Droid. And on the bottom, it's a little hard to see, I'm sorry. But it says, I'm, I'm doing an LS on the SD card, and you can see this file called AppCap with the date and time that I'm actually running this capture. And that file will have only the traffic for the browser and the calendar app. So you're not seeing anything else um, going on. So if I run a ping from the command line, you would not see that in that package capture. Okay, so um, now moving into more of the Dalvik stuff. Um, this part is a little unfortunate because I could probably spend the entire time talking about this. Um, but I, I kind of want to talk about more of the other features that Cobra Droid does and not just model them in one space. So I'm going to try to condense this a little bit so it might be a little uh, technically confusing. Um, but basically, Cobra Droid is using method hooking um, to be able to alert when a method is called. So we have these, these sandbox technologies you can submit to. I'm sure people have used some, like Cuckoo Sandbox, one of them. You know, it'll tell you what the app is doing. It'll, it'll kind of give you like a readout of, you know, it did this, and then it did Y, did X, great. So it kind of gives us an idea of what our application is doing. So I wanted to have that functionality in your version. When you download Cobra Droid, I want you to be able to do that. And not just do it based on what I think you should be alerting on. You should be able to alert on whatever you want. So when, when you download Cobra Droid, you'll get a list of functions that I care about, or rather methods that I care about. But you, you have the ability to change that file and put whatever you want in there. And these could be for, you know, system library calls, but this could be just for your application just downloading and testing. Um, so, so kind of the, the too long to read thing here is that um, we're instrumenting method bytecode during class loading. So if you can't take anything away from this, at least take that one statement. We're, just, we're instrumenting the bytecode during the class loading period. So, oh, this looks terrible. Um, so this slide um, would show the uh, configuration file. Um, it's very difficult to see. There, there are two sections in this file. There's a system section on the top, and there's a uh, app section on the bottom. That makes it a little easier to see. Um, and what's inside of this is um, a, a series of classes. So in this case, Android telephony, that telephony manager explained that's the class that queries on radio, and then n number of other classes. And on the bottom, the same thing is true for any applications you've installed, you have the, the class number. And with that, underneath it, you have uh, tab delimited, or, I'm sorry, tab, tabbed in uh, methods. So in this case, in top, I have get device ID. Um, and what that means is um, the device ID is the method. And after that is what I'm calling the action. And the action, in this case, is the only one implemented, which is alert, which I mentioned is going to tell you this, this method is called. And after that, which is impossible to see, is a, a string. And that string actually says an application access to device ID. So that makes it easy for you to see that when this, this method is called in an application, uh, that you're going to see that string, and, and it'll actually show up in a log buffer. So you can use the Android tools to cat a log buffer, and you'll see that application X did this. And just to demonstrate it, um, this is actually a little easier to see. You'll see I'm actually catting the um, security log, which is the log that I added for Cobra Droid. Um, and this will have all of the, the events happening on the device. So, on top, you'll see that the application com.jpg.testing, and you'll see that string that we inserted in the last slide, an application access to device ID, and then you'll see the actual uh, class and method afterwards. If you choose to omit a string, it'll just say the method call, or, and then it'll tell you the method in any class. Um, what I didn't mention on the last slide is that bottom one there says, you know, obfuscated method is accessing your contacts. And the reason I put that, method, that message for that one is um, the name of the, the method itself is NZKDS. So if we're looking at an obfuscated application and we want to know what that method is called, it's kind of hard to tell what NK, NZKDS does because it's really not a useful name. And a lot of applications, especially now, we're going to use obfuscation techniques to make sure that we can't look at what it's doing. So now we have this reminder that, hey, this function was called and it's a really terrible name, but we know that an obfuscated method is accessing the contacts because we did some, some static analysis beforehand. 
So it all works like magic, um, but it's a little more involved technically. Um, so I kind of illustrate the steps involved, and I have about six slides on this. Um, it could be, like I said, it could be 30 slides, uh, but I'll just kind of touch over the, the main points. So when we start the DVM, which is usually going to occur when the zygote starts, which is the main process on Android, each application will fork off the zygote. Uh, when, that, when that zygote process starts, we're going to insert our first hook there, and when it loads all the components of the DVM, we're actually going to store the configuration details from that previous file into some global memory trucks. Uh, and there's already structures in the DVM that allow this, so it's pretty easy for us. And then the second thing we're going to do is there's a structure that gets initialized at this time that's going to hold all the resolved classes, methods, fields, etc. for our given um, DEX code. It's a uh, DEX, DVM DEX structure. Um, it gets allocated given the actual size, excuse me, that's required. But we're going to do things like inserting the methods and inserting the strings. So we're going to have to actually over allocate this. So we're going to calculate how many strings we need to add, how many methods we're going to need to add, and we're going to over allocate the structure so that later we have to over. So the second step, um, when the zygote begins starting, it's going to actually load all the classes in the Android framework. And that's to save time uh, when each application starts, it already has a fully loaded instance of the DVM, which means that every application doesn't have to do any loading or initializing, it's already all there. So it's going to actually iterate through all the classes and load them. So at this time, we're going to, in the DVM, we're going to look at the class that's getting loaded. And if the class matches a class from the configuration file, we're going to set a flag in that structure and we're going to keep going. As the, the class begins loading, uh, it's going to load each method of that class. So we'll kind of go through all its methods and get those all set up as well. So for each of these methods, we're also going to check the name. If the name matches something from our configuration file as well, then we're going to kind of branch out and do something. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, allocate memory for this DEX code structure. And I apologize for these, these names here. The DEX code structure is basically a structure that initially is mapped pretty much right out of the DEX file itself. The DEX file is all your, your um, compiled application code. It's going to map that. It's going to take that whole structure, or that whole file, map it into memory. And it's going to set up all these pointers in that file. And one of the pointers is going to be a DEX code pointer. And that's the code segment for our particular method. Um, and we're going to take that, that structure, however many bytes that is, and we're going to allocate that many bytes plus n, where n is the amount of instructions that we want to add to our new code. So just to kind of show what the DEX code structure looks like, it's not terribly important. Um, but there's 16 bytes up front, which are mostly sizes and offsets. So how many registers does this method use? How many um, inputs is it getting? How many outputs? How many tries and catches are in this? Um, and then after that, which is a little more important, is the instructions one. So the INSN variable is a, uh, an array of 16-bit instructions. So these are our bytecode. Uh, it's a little difficult to see on the right, but these are you know, actual bytecode. So move, register, one, string, four, whatever. So it's all the, instru the assembly code, or the, well, the bytecode, rather, uh, for what this method does. So we actually we care about that section. We're actually going to change the code in this section to do whatever we want. In our case, we're going to insert hooks to actually um, call another method so that we can see the log event. So like I just said, we're going to actually, we're going to, we've already uh, like allocated the space we need. So now we're going to make a call to the, um, the, the class event notifier, which is the class that I wrote. And we're going to call it the notify event method. And that method just prints to the log the name of the application and whatever payload we have. So after we've, we've put that the code to do that in there, we have to kind of repair our remaining DEX codes. We probably just copied it all over to begin with. And now we have to make sure that all of our tries and our handlers and our debugging <coughs> are all realigned. Or otherwise, if there's an exception, it's going to jump to some random point and it's, everything's going to explode or it might not even uh, resolve. Um, so that way, uh, we're able to have our code execute before anything else executes in that method. And the final phase that we care about is called resolving. So when, the, when our application actually begins execution, um, it has this, this list of instructions already loaded in the DVM. And when the DVM actually says, hey, okay, let's start executing this method, um, it has this bytecode. And for example, on here, um, I have constant string v0. Uh, I'm actually going to step back first. Um, this is the like, a call to the, the log debugging log. So it's log.d, uh, a tag for where we actually are, and then a string. So in this case, uh, what is going to happen is we're going to load up our registers, 0 and 2, register 1 is not used here. Um, with strings. And these strings aren't actually in line. They're just offsets to a pool of constants that the DEX file knows about. 
So it's saying load into constant zero string 33. So it knows, well, this is the dex dump output. Dex dump has disassembled and told us that that string actually is time snake. But it doesn't actually know that, it just knows that it's string 33. So the resolver is responsible for finding out what that string actually is so that I can put it into um, that register. Similarly, after we do that, we're going to invoke the, the log debugging call. And that call is um, the log.d and static there. And that's just method 0004. So the resolver needs to determine if that, that function, I'm sorry, that method actually exists in our dex file or some other dex file. And in this case, it's another dex file. It's, we didn't define that method, it's defined in the framework. So that's what the resolver is going to do. So the question that comes up is um, how do we call a method or use a string that our dex file doesn't actually know about? So the message that we're injecting in there, that string doesn't actually exist anywhere unless somehow it, it did, but it probably doesn't. Um, we need to somehow get that into this DVM dex structure. And luckily, beforehand, we've already over allocated that structure. So when we get to the point where we're instrumenting our code and we know that our string doesn't exist, what we can do is we can say, instead of resolving you know, string four, um, we're going to resolve the string, the, the max plus an arbitrary number that we're using to identify that payload. So if there are 32 strings and we only have one additional string we're injecting, we're going to say we're going to resolve 33. And typically this is an error condition because, you know, the resolver is going to get that. It's probably going to segmentation fault at the end. It's going to say, you know, I don't have 32 strings, I only have 32. Um, but we can actually catch that exception there. And instead of treating this as an error connection condition, what we can do is we can say, we're going to manually resolve the string at this point. So we're going to say string 33 is this string that we've, that we've ejected into the EVM. So then when the code executes, it goes, oh, I know about string 33, and it just puts it in there, and it's good. And we can do the same thing for methods, too. We can set the method number to the max plus one or any number, and just catch that in the resolver. And then we can call methods from other dex files, or methods that don't even exist, and we can define them whenever we'd like. So that's kind of just a hooking thing at a high level. Um, I will be putting some information on the website in more detail later, um, but from a high level, that's kind of how that works. Um, so to get back to sort of the features here, uh, in addition to having all this lower stuff in the Android space, there's also several new applications. Um, so there's the, the proxy droid application, which is just a very simple way to proxy applications. There's the super user application, which makes it very easy to um, get the privileges, which isn't usually possible. Um, there's a new version of Mercury. Probably has used uh, the Mercury tool as a pen testing tool. Uh, it's called Droza. It basically, you impersonate an app Android application uh, from the command line, which is actually pretty useful. You can use it to interact with databases and stuff. Uh, and then there's just my front end that I love to kind of make all these forward features very easy for you to use so you can change your device ID, you can set up the pack cache, etc. So with that, I'm going to kind of roll into the demo here. So hopefully everything works good. Right. So, for the demo I have here, um, so I, I have this, this mystery app, I've just called it some mystery app. Uh, and so here's CoverDroid running. It, just, it looks exactly like the Android emulator if anyone's ever used it. Um, and what I've done is I've installed it here, so it's called Test App One. Uh, and there's also some other things here. There's this little bar here, which is uh, some of your configuration options. Uh, you can go ahead and turn these on or off. This is going to be your, you know, to turn on those mods that I was talking about before. And we also have proxy joint. I went ahead and I've already got that started running. So I'm proxying traffic to myself, uh, just over here in Burp. Um, so we're going to see any traffic we got coming off the phone. So you know, what I want to do before we get started is I also have a log tag going on the security log. So I'm going to clear that log out and I'm going to start that. So this is going to show us um, any methods I can call to find our hooks.com file. Um, what's in our hooks.com file? Uh, we can hear, we can get on the shell here, and we can you know edit that file. So in here, uh, there's there's three system calls that we know about that we're, we're alerting on, which is uh, the get device ID, get subscriber ID, and get line one number of the telephony manager class. And there'll be several classes and several methods, and you know what I actually do to release code right here. Uh, but for now, there's just these three here. And on the bottom, I have this commented out section, which is going to be the name of our application that we're going to. Uh, we're going to look at it in a minute. Okay, so let's close that for now. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and run this application. Actually, one more thing. Let's do one more thing. Let's, so I've disassembled the application as well. Uh, I used the tool APK tool. If anyone's familiar with uh, Android disassembly, it runs Somali over the, the dex file, which disassembles that. It unpacks our resources and decodes our Android manifest, which is very useful. So 
I'm just going to do an ls in the directory where our files are going to be located. Um, and we see the names of them are not very helpful. We have an a.somali, a b.somali, a main activity.somali. So the, fir the first two are some obfuscated classes, and the third one is just probably some activity we have which doesn't get obfuscated. So we know right away that our static analysis probably isn't going to be very helpful because the names are all going to be uh, ruined. So with that, let's finally run the app. So we just go ahead and click on it. So, and uh, we're presented with this, this error here. So this error could be if you're testing an app specific for a device or a specific carrier. Um, and it's basically telling us that this app isn't supported on this device. If it's malware, perhaps it doesn't run at all. If it's malware and it's less program it crashes, something happens. Um, but if something isn't working, um, so we can't even begin our assessment yet. Um, so we know that it's doing something to check what kind of device we have. So we can very simply um, just do like a grep over those Somali codes um, for the string build. And this, this string is going to be useful for us because that's uh, the class that I mentioned before, which is going to be for that, the, the access to variables necessary to acquire that data. So there's some noise on top just these string string builders. On the bottom, there's one right here that's Android OS build model. And it's hard to read over here, but that's in the main activity file. So I'm just going to go ahead and open that quick. Uh, OK, and I'm just going to look for model. OK, so we see here that it's, um, if anyone's not familiar with the syntax, it's the Somali syntax. It's kind of pseudo assembly ish. Uh, we're, we're getting the, the value of model, putting a register 0, the, the string razor, putting a register 2, and then we're doing an equals function on those. Um, so it's pretty clear to see what we're doing here. We're checking if the model is the string razor. Um, so now, normally what we would do if we didn't have code right, we'd, we'd probably take this line here and we'd comment it out or we'd make it actually match what our model emulator is. But we don't actually have to do that. So what we can do is we can go to the code right, we can, we can put this little guy here, which is going to pop up uh, through our interface to make our changes. And we can head to the custom build that property. So this is parsed out all the properties of this phone. And the model happens to be right here. And right now it's just the regular revision of code right. Um, so let's go ahead and change that to string razor. Okay. So we're just going to save that. And now it's, the phone is going to use that value as soon as we enable this guy here. So now it's going to use those values in the file um, when, it, when, it, when it actually queries that, that value. So, sorry, very good. So now we can run it again. And this time we don't get it there. So at this point, the application could do any number of things. Uh, in this case, it just presents a blank screen and just says the word connect. It could be a game, it could be anything. Um, but what we want to do now is now we're going to say, okay, well, let's, let's hit the connect one. There's really nothing else we can do here. So we'll click that, and we get another error. And this time it says, um, there was an issue connecting to the server, and it gives a reason. It says the certificate is not trusted. And in the fall, I mentioned that we're proxying traffic off this device. So the, the certificate that I'm proxying, in this case, Burp, is using is not what the application is expecting. Um, so normally now we have to take the application apart again, figure out where it's doing these checks, and kind of finesse and make that work. Um, but what we need to do is actually click this button here, which is just says SNL validation. And if you go into the main screen here, it's, there's a button here as well. Um, and basically what that's going to do is it's going to enable those changes to the SSL libraries. So if we run it again now, and we hit connect. Uh, does it doesn't like it still? Okay, hang on one sec. Last time I did this, my IP was changed. Sorry about that. Sorry. The proxy wasn't sitting on the right interface. Oh, let's try some more time here. Okay, much better. So now um, we see that Burp has captured the traffic. There was no warnings. Um, and we see that it's just posting to some site. Um, and in the payload, it's a couple of post parameters. Um, in this case, it happens to be our phone number, our uh, subscriber ID, and our device ID. So I'm just going to go ahead and forward that on. Um, and at this point, I'm going to switch over here to that security logins tab. I mentioned this tab is going to have all those um, method calls that we're interested in seeing. So we see here, um, it's, it's a little hard to see this wrapping around, but we see calls um, to, let's, let's see, you can get device ID method, the subscriber ID, you can get line one number method, 
Now they're all linking, so we see that this app, even if we didn't see the network traffic, we would know that it's doing something here. So now what we want to do is we kind of want to open up um, that, that file where it's doing that. Um, so we're going we're gonna to grab for uh, get device ID here. Get a couple of those same files that we've been doing. Okay, and we see one instance of the get device ID call, and that's in v.somali. So let's just go ahead and open up that file. And we can look for that. Okay, so clearly here we see those three calls. We see get line one number, get device ID, get subscriber ID, and then it's putting it into an array and setting up those post parameters in there. So if we scroll up a little bit, we see that this is a method called A. Um, so it's not a very useful name. If you look at the name of the class, the name of the class is B. So just looking at this, it's, it's not very useful for us for the, what the method A does. Um, so what we can do now is we will, um, we're going to edit our hooks.com file. I think I found my mouse. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and edit uh, etsyhooks.conf. And at the very bottom here, where we have this comment about section, it's a little hard to see for me. There we go. Okay, so we're going to actually, we're going to uncomment what that's there. So we're going to add what we just had there. So we, we started with our class. So we had com.jp. Uh, it was testing app, test app one, uh, dot b, enter tab. And we have a, we're calling the alert handler here. And we're going to make a string here that's going to say um, application access our device IDs. So it's just something useful for us to have when we, when we actually run this. So let's make sure everything looks good here. Oh. Did that the wrong spot. Um, so now that this stuff concept updated. So when we relaunch our application over here, we should see those strings, that those things happen in the uh, modules. So we're going to start over one last time, and while we're at it, we're going to enable the, the final mod, which is the telepathy manager. And if we go into that interface I showed before, uh, we could change the phone number to, you know, whatever we wanted here. Um, so let's do that. Just read that. This being a system RAM number, but in any case, it could be. The phone number or the Chinese number or something that it's, it might be looking for on the back end since we know it's posting those to the web server. Okay, so those are updated. Um, let's go ahead and launch the application. So again, we, we now see those, those new numbers here for our phone number. Um, and that might maybe help us on the back end. It, it looks for that number or something. Uh, we can actually just, we can see that that's there now. And if we go ahead and look over here, uh, we see um, this thing here saying that, you know, an application is accessing our device ID up here. So there's that string we put in hooks.com file. So now it's magically here, and we see that the, the method in the, the class is comjpcast1ba. So now every time that method is called, we're going to see that here. And this app could be much larger. This could be, um, maybe that was like the logging class that they implemented. So now we're able to see that that shows up for any n number of times it's going to be written. So to just to demo one last thing, I think I have a couple minutes still. Um, so here's the, the application capture, um, the, the, the actual application that's going to help you just capture specific apps. So let's go ahead and let's, let's find our application in here. And it should be in the bottom. Test that. Oh, it's like, okay. Um, we're going to just go ahead and click Enable, and it's going to prompt us for a file name. So this one will give it a little bit easier file name to write. I'm just going to call this brewcon.pcap, and that's going to go on our SD card. So when we hit save, 
um, to get a little notification if you're saying that it's running. And now we're just capturing traffic for the specific application. So to prove a point, we can um, we can take our app here, click the connect button again. Okay, see our traffic. Cool. Uh, let's go back to the home page and let's just open up the browser. We're just gonna grab that. Uh, let, let's just Google something. Type of, I don't know if it's there even. Yeah, okay. Um, so we just, we're going to Google something, um, but this is not our application, this is the browser. Um, so we see, we see everything we can find here. Um, now let's go ahead and stop our application capture. Okay. And then on our workstation, let's go ahead and uh, grab the file. Okay, and then we can open it up more actually, like I said. So now if everything worked correctly, what we should see is, uh, we'll see our SSL traffic from our application, which is good, we want to see that. Um, in this case, we really can't get much out of this because it's using SSL. But if we look for, say, the string um, BrewCon, because that's what we actually look for, we don't have any results. So we didn't actually capture the traffic from the browser, we just got the traffic that we were concerned about with our application. So that makes it much easier for us to actually see what the app's actually doing and not anything else, any other noise we're getting in between. Okay, so that's it for the demo. Uh, I'm gonna continue back on here. A couple slides left. Um, just for some future plans and research. Um, I mentioned really early that I'm using um, 2.3, which is pretty old at this point. Uh, I'd like to move that to ice cream sandwich or even jelly bean just to kind of put on a more updated platform. There's a lot of capabilities that we can do with this hooking framework. Instead of just alerting what methods are called, we can, um, the, the, what I see in my mind is um, the ability to have a payload. So when a method's called, when a method exits, um, you should be able to supply a payload that you've already written in Java, and it'll actually call that code, um, which will allow you to basically do n number of things, right? So, if, for example, if an application is you know, trying to resolve a domain, we can hook that method and give it a custom payload that on entry, it will, you know, give us that domain name. So we can see that in our logs exactly what it's doing. This will allow us to have a lot more um, capabilities when it comes to monitoring what, what our application is actually doing. In addition, there's a lot more man than other things we can do, not just network traffic, uh, but we can also man little things like database queries and kind of change them on the fly to make our testing a little easier. As well as I mentioned, the intents are IPC for Android. It'd be nice to see directed, directed intents, which are directed at a single application, just to see what's going on, see who it's talking to. So those are kind of the features that are going ahead and will be in the new version of CoverDrive. So, one last slide as far as getting information. Um, I'll be updating my website and my blog on more details on the talk, and as well as some technical details. Uh, as of right now, uh, the, the project is hosted as, as the beta version, which is lacking in some of the, the hooking and some of the applications to the captures. Uh, but you can go ahead and download that from my site here and also uh, the source code from my GitHub account. So when things are all finalized, uh, I'll be able to publish the, the real full-on code where one. But for now, it's still kind of in the testing phase. Um, so you don't have to kind of settle the data or you know, ping me if you want to try out the, the full version and your, and your mileage is going to vary that amount. So with that, uh, are there any questions? Comments? Hi. I am actually really tempted to, to compare the runtime I have to the JavaScript implementation. You get a pretty GDM, and for the next implementation, you're packing with my screen sandwich. One thing you can do the same like but you need the parameters and your return value if you change them automatically you know, on code or on classes and lists and then because for the moment it's interesting, it's not the best you can do because you cannot leave up in the box. Right. Information when it's when it's called it's very limited when you like that you want to be able to use it, especially if right. you're using HTTP, but maybe another protocol that you won't be able to do again. Yeah, and the JavaScript project you mentioned is actually very useful. Uh, but the way it's implemented, um, they didn't include all those features in the DDM. 
so it's not possible to port JavaScript to Debian. I'm sure it's possible, but the way they're doing it um, is not implemented in the Debian. Because I initially, that's, I kind of wanted the functionality to be very similar to JavaScript. It's got a really nice interface where you can, you know, inline capture the method, change it, do whatever you wanted at that time, which is much more powerful. Um, so I think eventually, what I'd like to go towards is what, yeah, what JavaScript does as, as far as as far as that goes. So I agree. To your opinion right now, uh, to your opinion right now, what would be the um, could that tool be used to industrialize and attack by identifying what is the security measure of an application and then creating stealing what is required from a client and identifying what is for the most applications right now. Most of the apps will try to identify the device ID and mm -hmm. try and then go out with this technology. Um, can you circumvent those attacks by any other means? Is there any way to provide any unique identification that cannot be replicated in that way? Um, I mean, are you saying it's like accessing that data? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the tool itself is more towards not actually preventing things, it's more for testing. Um, but, I mean, there are things you can do on, say, your phone. Um, to Kind of, you can change some system files so that you have root access and have it not return a unique ID. I mean, it's entirely possible. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to explain my, my thoughts, right? I'm sitting here too, and I'm thinking to myself, well, um, if I need to, um, if, if, there's, if there's an application that tries to do all those security measures that try to identify and make sure that it runs on the device that the credential that they were running for was, was, was it. Um, with this tool, you can actually, actually simulate a device almost quite the, 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 um, so from the from the app perspective um, if we don't know that so then you can launch an attack um, by just stealing those credentials and then running it and, and as I said industrializing yeah I mean I think that could be possible um, but I'm not sure if that's really you know what I guess what I would use it for but, but I think it's going to be good Any more questions? Yeah, what, what I would be interested in is um, what was your approach to develop the add-on? Is it like downloading the whole Android open source project and going down to the, to the operating system level and changing libraries and the DVM and stuff like that? And how can you then build the add-on and just extract it to that directly? For example, if you want to make any changes to the project, um, Um, yeah, so the way that I'm doing it is I have uh, the ASLP and I just make my changes and then I build it. Um, and then it, it creates all the system images for me and I just um, include those in the add-in directory. So when you specify the target, it uses that system image and the kernel in that directory. Um, if you wanted to change things, probably the easiest way, I mean, the most flexible way would be for you to download the source of CobraDroid. Um, and I have instructions on how to build it. If you really want to change it, or, you know, add, add something or change something, uh, you could just download it and change it and build it and put that in the add-in directory. If you wanted to be a little more tricky, you could technically, you know, run the add-in and pull the libraries off and then disassemble them and then kind of play with it that way, but I don't think you're going to have much success doing that. I think the better way would just be to build it and, you know, call it that way. Thanks. Yep. Any more questions? So I, I see that your method is kind of relying on uh, ADK tool or back spelling uh, to, to reverse engineer the application. My question is more about what about apps that cannot be reversed with, uh, with back spelling? I've seen some uh, problem over that has like weirdo instruction constructs and stuff that uh, makes back spelling fail. So do you have any ideas for that? Mm, I think. It I mean, you can use other disassemblers as well. I mean, that's just one that I find to be useful. Um, 
as long as the code is, installs code or whatever I'm running it, but as far as doing static analysis, I mean, if you can't get the code to disassemble, then you're probably going to figure out what the code's doing and try to get around that. But I mean, I don't have any personal any other choices besides, you know, Dex dump or Oxymon that are going to disassemble it um, successfully if there's some sort of bug in the way they made, you know, they structure the Dex file weird and things break when I try to disassemble, so. Not sure if I had anything really to get around that, unfortunately. Thanks. Yep. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, if there are no more questions, please give another round of applause. Yeah. 